Hello and welcome to my channel. I'm here with The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner is one of the most famous poems written in the Romantic period by one of its greatest figures, Coleridge. Samuel Taylor Coleridge had added the poem to the lyrical ballads. It was the ending poem of the volume. Uh, about the title of the poem and its subject matter, the title of the poem is The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, and the word rhyme here means a ballad. So it's a ballad of the ancient mariner. The ballads were uh, genres quite popular during the Middle Ages, and then uh, they were out of favor in the Renaissance and in the centuries after it. Anyway, there was a revival of the ballads around the Romantic era. And Samuel Taylor Coleridge here is also reviving the genre as part of the medieval revival, which is typical of the romantic poetry. So this is the ballad of the ancient mariner. And ancient here means a mariner who is of an old age. So we have an old mariner, the ancients relating to the past times. And anyway, the story setting is most probably somewhere around Middle Ages. We are not certain about the time and the place of the poem because they are not mentioned in it. Uh, this is a long narrative poem written in seven parts. And um, I will cover each part in one singular video. So I'm not going to cover the whole poem um, in one video because it is rather long. So we have a story. Let's see what is happening in the story. And let's know before reading the poem that Samuel Taylor Coleridge uses a series of archaisms in the poem, in the spellings of the words or in some of the words which are used. Archaism means the intentional usage of uh, words spelled in, in their older forms or the words which are not popular in usage at, at the time of the writing of the poem. But Coleridge um, had uh, equipped his poem with such words to show something of his knowledge and also to put the story in its original context. Also, structure-wise, Coleridge has used uh, the techniques of writing a ballad. Uh, some of the stanzas follow uh, the, uh, the rules and the conventions of the ballad stanza. And there are refrains, repetitions, incremental repetitions in the poem, as we can see. The poem has uh, some different versions. At first, it was written without any explanations, but uh, there, there was maybe an explanation about the course of the narrative because maybe the, it was difficult for the audience to know what's up in the poem. And later on, Coleridge added this uh, epigraph to the poem and also he um, he added some glosses to the poem to, to explain what is happening in the course of the narrative. Anyway, I have omitted the glosses here uh, because I can explain things myself. And the glosses were um, famous for making the readers more confused. So let's start part one. Uh, there is a frame narrative or a frame story and a story within the story. We have the character of the mariner who is now old and he's trying to narrate his stories to some wedding guests. And then we have the narrative of the mariner within this narrative. At some parts in the story, we get back to the frame and then we go to the, uh, to the uh, main story, actually, which is the story of the mariner and what had happened to him when he was younger. It's an ancient mariner and his toughest one of three. And then the dialogues are put in quotation marks, uh, the part of the dialogues. And we have to know that ballads uh, were formed uh, in form, uh, in, in actually uh, in give and take in a dialogue. So here uh, we have another aspect of a mid uh, medieval ballad as it is used by Coleridge. By thy long beard and glittering eye, now wherefore steppest, steppest, thou me for example the usage of the word uh, thou and some other um, you know, verb forms uh, are uh, markers of Coleridge's archaism in this poem so we have some wedding guests by the side of a church and the ancient mariner stopping them 
The bridegroom's doors are opened wide, and I am next of kin. The guest is talking. Next of kin means I am um, I am a close relative. The guests are met. The feast is set. Missed here. The Meriden. They are getting married, and the guest wants to be there, but the ancient man or the old man there had stopped them. He holds him with a skinny hand, the skinny hand of the mariner. He holds him with a skinny hand. There was a ship, cause he, said he. How doth iron hand me grey beard loon? Loon means lunatic. Eftsoons, his hand dropped he. Eftsoons means immediately. Uh, there are a series of paintings by Gustave Doré about this poem, and this is one of them. We see the wedding guests, uh, the three of them, and the one stopped by the mariner and the uh, lunatic appearance of the mariner with his long uh, gray beard and hair and his eyes, which are somehow uh, uh, bold in this picture. He holds him with his glittering eye. So he has unhanded him, but he's holding him, stopping still uh, with his glittering eye. Coleridge was familiar uh, with psychological notions. The term psychology was not used at the time. Uh, by the way, Coleridge uh, was familiar with the techniques of the mind, like hypnotism, cult mesmerization at the time. And here, the mariner mesmerizes the guest, so he stops him with his eyes. The wedding guest stood still and listens like a three years child. The mariner has his will. The wedding guest sat on a stone. He cannot choose but hear. And thus spake on that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. And the story begins here. The ship was cheered. The harbor cleared. Merrily did we drop below the kirk. Kirk means a church. Below the kirk. Below the hill. Below the lighthouse top. Here, Coleridge is referring uh, to the roundness of the earth. As they are moving, uh, things seem to get below, to get lower. Actually, this is because of the form of the earth. Now, there are some other uh, facts about uh, the science of the earth uh, across the poem. The sun came up upon the left out of the sea came he uh the sun is sorry oh, let me get back uh the sun came up upon the left out of the sea came he and he shone bright and on the right went down into the sea uh when the sun moves from uh, left to right means that they are moving towards the south. Let me let me let me just uh, show you. So they are moving somewhere towards the south. We don't exa we don't know exactly where they are going or when they have started the journey or from which location, but we know this fact that they are moving towards the south. And he shone bright, he is the sun, and on the right went down into the sea. Higher and higher every day, till over the mast at noon. The sun over the mast at noon, just above the mast at noon. The wedding guest here beat his breast, for he heard the loud bassoon. The sound of the feast of the wedding. Anyway, when the sun is just above the mast, the mast is uh, the, the uh, biggest or the largest kind of ma uh, uh, the place 
on a ship and the sun is just over there, it means that they are in the equator. The sun is actually at a, is at a 90 degree angle with the earth. And then uh, from this fact mentioned in the poem, we know that they are somewhere around the equator line. Uh, in a like, like tropical or hot place. We are back to the wedding. The bride has paced into the hall, red as a rose, as she, nodding their heads before her goes, the merry minstrelsy. Minstrelsy as a reference to the musicians present in the wedding. The wedding guest, he beat his breast. It, as you can see, some lines are repeated, but the story continues. This is called an incremental repetition, one of the techniques in a ballad. The wedding guest, he beat his breast. The, when we have a repetition and addition, yet he cannot choose but hear. And thus spake on that ancient man, the bright eyed mariner. And now the storm blast came and was tyrannous and strong. He struck with his o'ertaking wings and chased us south along. So the storm was there, then they moved towards even more to the south. So they were on the equator, and now from the equator line, they're moving towards the south, towards the south pole, actually, maybe. <laughs> Uh, well, the sloping mass and dipping prow, as as you can see, uh, informed the ship. And who pursued with yell and blow, still treads the shadow of his fall. The the ship, as if uh, it is escaping from his its its enemy, and forward bends his head. The ship drove fast and loud roared. The blast, the southward, I, yes, we fled. So they moved more and more towards south because of this storm. And now there came both mist and snow. They are in the South Pole, and it grew wondrous cold and ice, mast high came floating by, as green as emerald. And through the drifts, the snow eclipsed, it sent a dismal sheen. Dismal means like having a sick kind of, sick kind of uh, color sheen means shining, nor shapes of men, nor beasts we can. Can means to know, the eyes, was all between. The ice was here. The ice was there. The ice was all around. It cracked and growled and roared and howled like noises and a sound. Uh, cracked and growled and roared and howled is an example of cacophony in the poem. Uh, cacophony refers uh, to a series of consecutive, let, let's say, of harsh grating noises in a poem. It cracked and growled and roared and howled like noises in a sound. And a sound is a fit, kind of getting unconscious and making um, unwanted noises like that. At length, did cross an albatross. Albatross is a big bird. So, uh, a sorrow here is through, through the fog it came, as if it had been a Christian soul, beheld it in God's name. From the beginning of the entrance of the albatross into the story, uh, we see the association um, of, of the spirit to a Christian soul, to Christianity, maybe to some Christian symbols, as we, as we may see in the next parts of the poem. And as soon as the bird came, things get better. 
It ate the food it never had eat, and round and round it flew. The ice that split with a thunder fit, the helmsman steered us through. They can move now. And a good south wind sprang up behind the albatross that follow. And every day for food or play came to the mariners hollow. So they, the, the wind comes and they can move. And also the bird came every day to the mariners hollow to say hello to them. In mist or cloud, on mast or shroud, it perched for vespers night. Vespers means evenings, whilst all the night, through fog smoke white, glimmered the white moonshine. So the weather is calm, but there is wind, so uh, the ship can move. And this is Gustave Doré's painting of the thrilling moment uh, that they were leaving that place. And that the, the bird is painted here. God save the ancient mariner, the wedding guest is talking, from the fiends that plague thee thus. The, the mariner looks pale all of a sudden. And then uh, the wedding guest is shocked. Why lookest thou so? Why, 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 why lookest thou so? Why, why you seem so? Are you, are you pure, like, like not normal? The ancient mariner replies, but my crossbow, I shut the albatross. And here we can see Doré's painting of this moment. And it is exactly at this part that the first uh, section of the poem ends. Uh, the poem is written in seven parts, so we have to see what is going to happen in the uh, next sections. Uh, I hope you can follow my other videos. Thank you very much for listening.